Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance. From God our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Our text for our meditation this morning is taken from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 17, verses 22 through 24. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar plant. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the field will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. So far, text. Your Christian friends, you've heard an expression, grow where you are planted. It is a scriptural thought where wherever God places you in life, He expects you to grow, to take the gifts that He's given you and to be faithful with them and to accomplish His will. I don't think that's what He's talking about in these verses, though. I think he has something far different planned. He's not really talking about us at all, although we're going to get to our role in his kingdom at the very end. He's talking about what he's going to accomplish. And it's awfully powerful. And so I want to go forward under the theme, God the Father does it all. Talk about a great dad. He lowers the lofty, and he raises the repentant. Listen once more to the first verse of our text. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. This is a beautiful verse, and the symbolism might be lost on us, but to those Jews who were in captivity and exile, it wasn't. You see, every building that had anything to do with importance was made of cedar. This was the most expensive wood you could find. David collected cedar for the palace, but God said he couldn't build it. He built his own palace, though. He built all kinds of beautiful buildings in Jerusalem out of cedar. And yet now, things looked a little rough. Jerusalem was on fire, and the Jews were in exile, and so it didn't look good at all. It looked awful. And so before we go into exactly how they looked, let's talk about you for a second. How do you look? And to help you out, I want to give you maybe a comparison, because sometimes that's what we do. We look at ourselves and we think, I look pretty good. So maybe we look at somebody else. Well, how do you look compared to this guy? How many of you know who that is? His name is Dylan Roof. He is a white supremacist. He's a little crazy. He um, last week went to a church in South Carolina, and uh, he spent an hour with the nine people at a church in a Bible class and talked to them, and he almost didn't kill them because they were so nice, but he just had to because they were black. One by one, he shot them all, except for the last person whom he wanted to leave alive so, he could te- so that she could tell the story of what had happened that day. It's despicable. I, I, cannot, I have a hard time relating to this guy because it just fathoms, it, I, don't, I don't get it, how he could be so full of hate and just matter-of-factly go and do that. He was caught, you probably heard this, in North Carolina. And the sheriff's deputies who took down his stories had one comment about him, and that was he was completely unrepentant. He would do it again. He still thinks that he's right. Now, I don't know what he thinks he's going to find when he meets his, meets his maker, but it's not rainbows and butterflies. God the Father is not a tottering old fool. And last week we talked about the sin of unrepentance, and if you push the Holy Spirit away in the Gospel, there is no forgiveness of sin left. 
And hell is a very real place. And I do fear for this young man's soul. But it's Father's Day, and we talked about how you looked, and compared to him, I think you all look pretty good. But now, what do you think happened to this guy's father? Franklin. How's his life right now? Oh, it's bad. He's getting death threats from all kinds of people. Whites and blacks alike do not like him. He's under police protection, and he just thinks that the press is out to get him. And let's just, it's Father's Day for a moment, let's assume that he had absolutely nothing to do with the hate that fills the soul of his son. It's just unfortunate that he has this bad reputation. So, we come full circle, and we talked about you. What kind of a reputation have you given God the Father? How is it that He looks when people look at you? What would you think of my dad after you've gotten to know me, some of you, for the whole 12 years of my ministry? Maybe you could imagine what he is like. Maybe you can't. I think Father's Day is a tough day because not everyone has a wonderful dad. But frankly, that's beside the point. All of us are without an excuse because all of us have a Father who is awesome. And that is our Heavenly Father. And here you have people who know who their father is and want desperately to hear from him. You see, our text talks about the New Testament church. And yet for those Jews living in exile, they didn't know if they were going to see the promised land ever again. They didn't know what their God thought about them. For the prophet Ezekiel, the words that he offers them in the Gospel is so powerful. You have to know a little bit of Bible history. Because any time you say the word Ezekiel, something is very wrong. He's in a foreign country ministering to people who will probably never see home again. God's people fell away during the time of the kings. You have the northern ten tribes, that's Israel. And then Judah, and Benjamin was nearby. That's the southern ones. Well, they fell away from God and they turned away. And the stakes were a little bit higher in the Old Testament. You see, if they fell away, all wrapped up into the nation of Israel was this promise of a Savior. And so God could not stand idly by and just let them worship idols. He called them to repentance over and over again with prophets. And when they refused to repent, there was a very real judgment. You can read it on the pages of the Old Testament. And he sent the Assyrians. In 734, S.R. Haddon came on and destroyed everything. He leveled them. This is the guy that would put heads on stakes just as a calling card. He destroyed them so completely that you see that red line. He um, took other people to displace the ten northern tribes so that there weren't families. He mixed it up completely, different ethnic groups, so that the people could never again exist. It's like if somebody took all of the people from America and mixed in Canadians and Brazilians. I suppose we're a mix anyway, but they tried to displace them completely. The ten northern tribes are gone. Well, you go back, and a hundred years later, things got bad in Judah, too. Well, this is the last of the last. And God doesn't destroy them completely, lest He lose His promise of a Savior. And so He sends in a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians. And in 604, the first exiles left. This was the brightest and the best. This was Daniel. This was Ezekiel. This was the king, the nobles. They went away, and what was left was just well, the dregs of society. And there they sat for 70 years. They were repentant, unlike Dylan Roof. And they were terrified that they would not get to go home. And so you have Ezekiel bringing the promise of forgiveness. The promise that they would go back in 70 years. And yet, that doesn't mean that everything was all rainbows and butterflies yet. You see, they were broken. They were extremely disappointed. Some of them knew they were going to get to go home in 70 years, and yet, even if life expectancy is what it now, 
how old would you have to be to remember what things were? If we turn back to Ezra, there are people who did remember. This is Ezra chapter 3, verse 12. When the foundations of the temple were, were laid, well, people wept. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundations of the temple being laid. They remembered that temple laid with gold. Beautiful marble, cedar everywhere. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed everything, carried off as plunder. And they realized as they sat by the rivers in Babylon that it was all their fault. And so what's left? Well, our God offers Words of hope. Here, verse 23. On the mountain heights of Israel, I will plant it. This little sprig that would come that no one could imagine. Even though David's line looked horrible, did it look any better when Jesus was born? A foreigner reigned in Jerusalem. It didn't matter. Mary and Joseph, the descendants of David's line, went to Bethlehem and Jesus was born, the King of the universe. And that little bit of hope was the start of that New Testament church and oh, how it grew. These people had so much to look forward to. You see, God the Father does it all. True, He lowered the lofty. And yet He raises the repentant. Do you guys know who these people are? Is there anything wrong with that picture? And there's nothing wrong with the lighting of the camera. That baby looks awfully yellow, doesn't he? At nine months, he's a little bit old for jaundice, isn't he? This is Caleb Munn on the far left, that baby. He has a rare liver disease, and he was about to die. They frantically looked for a liver transplant, and yet they couldn't find one. Well, except for his dad, although his dad doesn't have the same blood type. He had the same kind of liver that he needed, but he thought he couldn't be a transplant candidate. But the good news is that God in His infinite wisdom made it so that babies cannot reject organs. You know that? And so Brian happily gave up part of his liver for his son. I mean, who would? Liver? I don't need that. Here you go, son. And so now, on Father's Day, Caleb is looking less yellow. And he's smiling. Now, we needed far more than a liver from our Heavenly Father. We needed a complete heart transplant. We needed a new soul. We were dead in our transgressions and sins, and yet God made us alive in Jesus. He forgave all of our sins. And there's so much more. This great tree, it will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. God gives us all the fruit that we could ever need to feed our souls. It doesn't stop at the resurrection. It starts there. And so the rest of your life is one where you don't get to pay back your God. You don't get to earn your salvation. Jesus did that. Your life is a giant thank you card. Your Heavenly Father, for all that He's done for you. And the joy that it brings you every day. And I started off with that picture of a plant growing where it ought not have. You see, I don't think that this text talks about where we should grow where we're planted. We're supposed to grow where we're not planted and reach out and spread the kingdom of God. We talk about, last week, how the gates of hell will not prevail, how the strong man is bound up, and how we go into Satan's domain into a heart that does not believe and bring the tree of the gospel. And in it comes and nothing can stop it. Yes, God the Father does it all. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. There's nothing that you can't do with the help of your Father. What is it that you want to change about yourself? What is it that you don't like that you can learn from your dad? Go in and see His will for your life. Open your eyes to the opportunities that you have. Maybe tell someone that doesn't know who He is so that God's kingdom might come into their life also. Dear friends, God the Father has done it all. Amen. Please stand.